are my witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Let us pray. Good gracious God, we've come to this time and place to seek you out in our lives. As scripture is shared with us this morning, reveal yourself beyond the words and take flesh in our hearts to know the depth of who you are and who we are by that relationship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of my uh, favorite cartoons growing up, if I can advance the slide, which I cannot for some reason. There it is. One of my favorite uh, cartoons growing up is Scooby-Doo. Any Scooby-Doo fans out there? Nobody dislikes Scooby-Doo, right? That's just one of those commercials we all, uh, commercials, uh, cartoons we all love. A group of teenagers, what a great plot, right? A group of teenagers running around in this hippie van solving the mysteries of the world, uh, these haunted places, these scary places. And Scooby-Doo and, the, and the, uh, the gang try to figure out what's the real story. Most people's favorite character, including my own, of course, are, are Scooby and Shaggy here, the dog and the guy in the green shirt. And, you know, the heroes in this uh, cartoon are the two biggest Frady cats of them all. Like, they are just terrified of their own shadows. And what always got me about this sh show is that uh, Scooby and Shaggy, I mean, y you could be a hundred episodes in and they're just as scared of the next place that they were at the first episode. You would think that after, you know, the, the, the unmasking of the villain and it turns out to be just, just a guy um, and I would have got away from it, too, if it weren't for you darn kids. They always say that at the end. You would think that after, you know, some time that Scooby and Shaggy would have figured it out and said, oh, it's, maybe it's not a haunted house after all. Maybe it's not a ghost. And uh, it, it made me think about, but they never do. Maybe it, uh, it made me think about Luke's gospel here. This is going to give me problems today, John. So you're, you're, <laughs> you'll have to advance the slide. Thank you. Uh, this is, it made me think of Luke's gospel today when we read Jesus himself stood among his disciples and he sort of appears in this post-resurrection time, the first time they're seeing him, and he says, peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. What an interesting reaction. I wonder if that's where we find ourselves today in the church, that many of us like the disciples, look at Jesus and we think of him more like a ghost than anything else. Um, but like the end of Scooby-Doo, where the mask is revealed and we find out it was a human all along, it was somebody, it was flesh and blood, like the end of the episode, that's what the Gospel of Luke's whole point is, is to say, no, this is who this really is, this is the real Christ, this is the real presence, it's not, it's not a ghost, Jesus is real. Next slide. Which is why he tells the disciples multiple times in this passage today in Luke, it's me, look at me, I'm real, look at my hands, look at my feet. He shows them, touch them, see them, taste it, whatever it is, see it, it's real, experience it. Uh, and, and Oh, and you don't still believe me? Give me something to eat, give me a, some fish, what are you eating right now? I'll eat it in front of you. That's the whole point of what Luke is trying to make here is that Jesus isn't just a ghost. Jesus isn't just some idea. The thing about the scripture here is that it's trying to make this point that Jesus isn't some idea. He's not a good message. He's not a good story. He's the real thing. He's the real thing in our life. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face, particularly in our 21st century modern world today, that, that somehow we've turned Jesus into this, this spiritual idea. We've turned him into a ghost again. Which you would think that surely we would know by now, and yet Scooby and Shaggy can't seem to figure it out. And we need to be reminded as well, again and again and again. Where does that leave us when our faith treats us like a ghost, but afraid and fearful like these disciples uh, living in, in, in this world where there is real problems, real terror? The forces of darkness are real, and we know them, right? Turn on the news. There's nothing that feels more real than bombs going off in countries and the fear that we recognize and the violence within our communities and death and disease and anger. We know these things are real because we experience them. 
all too often. So we become like those disciples who've hidden away from all of the real terrors of the world and tried to huddle as much as we can, protecting ourselves, insulating ourselves from the things that go bump in the night, the dark forces in this world. We, we try to control and manicure our lives so that we can have some safety and security from a turbulent world. And then we end up settling for a story that, you know, Jesus might be alive. We've heard rumors of it. We've heard the Easter message, some reports here and there. But until we've actually seen him firsthand, we settle for just a ghost, just an idea. I think the whole scripture's point in Luke and John and and, in these gospel stories is that that's not the substitute we need. We don't need a spiritual idea of Jesus somewhere far off who's not connected to our flesh and blood real life. We need one who's really in our life every day, walking through the struggles, who's more real than even the dark forces that we know all too well. If I was to ask you, where has Jesus become real in your life? This is rhetorical. You don't have to blurt it out. But think about that. What might you say? Where has Jesus become real, embodied in your life? Hard to do, right? When we eat together, together, sure. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But for a lot of us, even for me, Sometimes it's hard to do to say those actual real-life examples to say, this is where Jesus was real. This is where I saw Jesus come alive. This is where I had that post-resurrection Easter world experience. And the problem with that is that we keep Jesus very far away in that spiritual ghostly form instead of saying he's here right next to us here and now. God is ultimately invested in our life in the flesh and blood reality of this world. We wind up talking a lot about Jesus, in particular in our worship setting like this, but it's almost as if he's absent. We're talking about him far away instead of saying, maybe he's right next to us. Would that change the way we speak and the way that we live and the way that we navigate life if we really believed that Jesus was right next to us in our relationships, in our struggles, and the real mess that we often find ourselves in? I think it would. But what happens is we can confess Jesus is Lord. Many of us have been a part of the church for a very long time. Um, We've heard the resurrection story. We've heard Easter. But often our actions belie our faith. And just like those disciples, just like Scooby-Doo and Shaggy, we become afraid of our own shadow and the own brokenness that we really face. And we think that that world is more real, more powerful. We give ground to that and we let it be the things that really shape our lives. But Jesus tells us a different story. Jesus shows us a different story, that he is the embodiment of God's presence in our world, and that we are called to experience it. John, if you change the slide, I'm going to try this one more time. Nope, I'm putting it away. This is St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa was a... uh, born in 1515 in Spain, and she became one of the famous church mystics. Um, Wasn't a good time, by the way, in the Inquisition to be born a woman and a mystic in that time. Um, But her her, uh, hope was to somehow commune with God, and she uh, joined a, a convent, and she spent her time in prayer and in meditation and trying to find a way to connect with God in a deeper way. And Saint and Saint Teresa, as any good mystic, had a spiritual encounter in which God spoke to her. She records it in her writings, and, and uh, she talks about this deep way in which God showed up in her life in very real ways. Um, and by one of her uh, famous prayers sort of sums up her attitude of how God spoke to her and how she viewed her theology and how God was present in her life. And John, if you advance that. This was her prayer. She says, Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Next slide. What if we believed that? 
what if we brought that reality to this world to say that maybe we've had a hard time articulating where Jesus is because we haven't believed that the embodiment of Christ comes in very different ways in our friends and our families and our neighbors and in, in nature in all kinds of ways in which God is speaking and saying, here I am right next to you. Not absent, not an idea, but right here with you. I think it's important for us to gather in this time and space in worship to listen to God's voice, to come to this table, right? And, and Peter, you said it a second ago that, you know, part of our theology here is in, in why we have communion every week. This table blessing is, is not just to receive some bread and wine, but, but to really trust that somehow in this promise that Jesus shows up. And this is a foretaste, a small glimpse of how God is truly present in our lives. It's why we don't just preach, but we, we're a sacramental church, meaning the physical way in which God joins us is important. That we can taste the bread, the wine. We can know that experientially that somehow God is present in our life. We can be reminded as we go out into the world that we're not going out alone. We've already tasted and seen that God has joined us in some special way. And we become that sacrament, right? We become that body. We, we, we recognize we're being sent out into a world still of brokenness and, and, and violence and the realities that seem all too crushing. They're still real, but there's something more real than that. Notice at the end of the reading today in Luke, Jesus sort of closes like this. After they've seen him, after they've touched him, after they've, they've ate together, they experienced him, he says, you, my disciples, you've seen me, you've touched me, you, you know it's really me, you're my witnesses. You're my witnesses. It's an important word because a witness is someone who's seen something. And someone who's seen something, even from a legal standpoint, you know, you're a witness in court, what do you do? But you, you witness to what you saw, what you experienced. Jesus says that, now that you've experienced me, now that you've witnessed me, you're my witnesses in the world. Because the world, people around in this world, are going to think the reality of darkness and violence and terror and all those things that are all too real have the ultimate say. And the only way they're going to know that there's something even more real than that is when my witnesses go out and embody and share a different message. Teresa the mystic, Luke the gospel writer, they, they write these things to witness to God at work in their life and how it transformed them every moment they would live in the way that they would encounter and bring that message to the world. I want to show you a, a short video that I think gets to the heart of this message. John, I'll ask you to roll that. It's about three minutes, so it's a little, it's a little longer. Um, Why does he do this every day?
ราะสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขสวยงามกว่าเดิมในชีวิตคุณอะไรคือสิ่งที่คุณต้องการมากที่สุดไทยประกันชีวิตเชื่อในความดี Why does the man go about doing good in the world? It's not for his own sake; it's for the sake of others. The video says, "It's what does he get in return for it? He doesn't get to be famous. Doesn't get broadcast on the news like so much other stuff. But he gets emotions. Um, I, I would argue um, that may be a life insurance commercial, but I would argue from a biblical perspective, uh, it's not just emotions. He gets to be human." He gets to join the human experience of each one of those encounters that he had around them, around him. And the more human you become, the more flesh, the more human the world becomes around you. See, we don't have a God, Jesus, who just wants us to all be these disembodied spirits, attached, unattached from each other. God wants to get, draw closer to us in the fullness of our humanity, in the struggle, in the pain. Each one of those people in that story right there had their own struggle, but somehow, because of one person, he brought joy in humanity, in life, and transformation. Folks, that's Christ's presence being brought. That's the world becoming more real, not less. Right? We're not trying to make people more spiritual. We're trying to make them more human in the way God intended. That's our role as the church. That's your role in the midst of that. Every encounter is like this. Don't undersell it as if it's a small way. What could it mean if you had these multiple encounters in which God placed in in your life, and every day it may seem thankless. Your name may not be in the newspaper at the top. May not be this glamorous thing, and yet you get to be real. You get to be the embodiment of Christ's presence in this world. That's that's who we are. Let us be witnesses of the joy that God brings, the transformation of what God is doing in our world, bringing that ultimate reality that we are loved unconditionally, and that God's presence is here. Will you pray with me? God, too often. We find ourselves like those disciples, just afraid of all of the scary things in our lives, our anxieties and our fears, and they seem all too real. They seem more powerful, more pressing than anything else. Today, we pray that your scripture, your embodiment, comes before us and changes that storyline, that lie, that we might experience something even more real, that we might experience your presence. And not only ourselves, but may we be conduits as your church, sharing your embodied presence in the world, that all people might know the joy of what it means to have the reality of your love embodied. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of the day: "Touch that soothes and heals."